Um, so in this session, which is about evidence and policy making and value-based healthcare, um, we're going to have two speakers, doctors Arash Rashidian and John Lavis. Uh, Arash is going to talk about WHO strategies for enhancing national institutional capacity for evidence-informed policy making in EMR countries. And John is going to talk about the Global Commission on Evidence to Address Societal Challenges, Insights, Recommendations, and Pathways to Influence. Arash is going to uh, start, and I will introduce him. Uh, he will talk for about 20 minutes. John will subsequently talk for 20 minutes, and then we'll have in the vicinity of 20 minutes for discussion. Arash is Director of Science, Information, and Dissemination in the Eastern Mediterranean region of the World Health Organization, leading WHO regional agenda in areas of health information systems, evidence-informed policymaking, knowledge sharing, research development and governments, e-health, and WHO publications since 2015. Pretty broad mandate. He's the executive editor of the Eastern Mediterranean Health Journal, the flagship WHO publication in the region. He has an established career in health policy and systems development and research, joined the WHO from his position as professor of health policy and deputy chancellor at the Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Previous positions included founding director of the National Institute of Health Research in Iran and academic and policy advice positions in the UK, Iran, and Pakistan. Arash, over to you. Many thanks. I mean, that was a very generous introduction. So I, I was expecting that you would say just the first few lines, but I mean, that's, 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 I mean uh, um, I'm thankful for that. So colleagues, I directly go to my presentation. First, I'm sharing my presentation slides. So just give me a second. Can you confirm that it's visible? Yes, I, I can see your. I can see what you what you have up there, Rash. Okay, um, many thanks. Uh, hello again, colleagues. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to all of you, uh, depending where you are uh, connecting from. So, as the Gordon very kindly uh, mentioned, I'm going to talk about what WHO is doing in support of countries in terms of enhancing evidence-informed policymaking. And basically, I will talk about a framework of action that is the, I mean, the, the document and the plan for action for the WHO in the region. Within that, I will refer to a concept that is the guiding concept for us, uh, called integrated multi-concept approach. Uh, and then the, referring to some elements of that in terms of harmonization and linkages. And I will finish by the work that is happening in the region, areas of uh, certain examples and obviously areas of collaboration that exist in uh, different groups. Okay, so this is a busy slide. I apologize for that. I uh, stopped the animation of it to save time, but this is a timeline you can see from 2001. And uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with WHO terminology, RC stands for Regional Committee. That's the annual meeting of the ministers of health in the region. And WHA for the Health Workers Assembly. That's the global meeting of ministers of health. So as you can see, I mean, for many years, there has been decisions related to evidence-informed policymaking globally and also at the, in the regional level. However, only few of those refer to institutional capacity within the country. So that these decisions were mainly focused on processes and examples of the use of, uh, I mean, the capacity for evidence informed policymaking rather than institutional capacity. So in an important meeting that uh, WHO held in Lebanon in 2019, which I mean, the, the John was also the, an important uh, team, uh, uh, the, the discussion in that meeting. So there, there were certain ideas in terms of how to enhance institutional uh, capacity was uh, I mean, uh, discussed and framed and put together, resulted in a decision in October 2019. So that's, that's I mean, the, where we are in terms of the program. And since then, I mean, that has been the guiding principle. 
So this uh, framework is uh, trying to bring different elements of evidence in foreign policy, making under one umbrella and uh, talking about the knowledge translation processes, which is the, the main issue that brings the whole processes together, but linking that with, for example, health technology assessment processes, guideline processes, use of routine and national data and other sources of evidence that are often used within uh, countries for decision making. And in a way, trying to sort of uh, commit countries and also engage with countries in an integrated approach for multi concept uh, collaboration and linkages. So to, for this to happen, I mean, the minimum criteria is that the programs should talk to each other in terms of the directions and also use of each other resources. And it should be systematically between key elements of those programs. And I explain what, what is meant by that uh, very quickly in a few minutes. So as you noted, the six element uh, or six uh, conceptual approaches towards evidence-informed policymaking were listed in the previous graph. I'm hi highlighting some of the key specificities of each one of those. And you will see that there are a lot of uh, common elements within those programs. For example, the priority setting is a requirement for every one of them, but some of the, the, these programs also have their own focus and their own areas of attention. So within knowledge translation processes, for example, the, I mean, the, uh, the focus is on key policies at national level, I mean, major policies that uh, are potential to make impact and uses different tools, but mainly I mean, through policy groups and policy dialogue. When we refer to health technology assessment approaches, I mean, the focus becomes usually focused on technologies that includes medicine, but other technologies, and those approaches, even in the public health era, could be specific decisions that are going to be made. One major feature of that is to bring the economic evaluation data, cost effectiveness processes, and along other things for recommending certain decisions to policymakers. On guideline program, usually it's about a decision for a disease or related to public health issue. So again, I mean, different sources of evidence coming, but decisions are about um, the recommendations are really relevant to usually, I, I call it micro, but I'm not saying that it's not important. I mean, micro in terms of the level of decision making. So micro questions that what should be done for this patient or a patient with these characteristics, if I mean, they are presented to in, in such a setting. So what would be the best course of action? Or in terms of public health, for example, the vaccination program, how to implement vaccination program uh, for a certain group I mean, it, uh, based on what, what priorities and what criteria. So in that sense, again, different sources of evidence coming together. When it comes to data, whether it's been routine data, health information system, data coming from civil registration, especially I mean, causes of death and uh, mortality data, as well as national surveys, especially household surveys, uh, usually, I mean, they are, uh, I mean, ideally, they are focused on the key questions of policymakers, so things that are unknown, or sometimes uh, they are conducted to understand what's going on in terms of I mean, the major household survey might be conducted to give a picture. But then the main benefit they have is the sort of identifying the areas of focus for policymaking or areas of challenges, and as well as also helping to, for example, mon uh, monitor progress in terms of uh, action. But then I will show us exam examples to you, but people, colleagues who have been engaging in policymaking for long, they know these are usually the most favorable source of evidence considered by policymakers at national level, the, the first source that they usually refer to when they want to justify their actions or to I mean, get guidance from some sort of evidence. So in a way, bringing that into the picture becomes important. At the same time, these data are often required for adaptation of global um, evidence I mean, coming from research that is happening in other settings based on systematic review. When you want to see how it's applicable to the context of another country, national data is the one that helps you to, to, to do that and when needed. And then ad hoc studies that are often ignored in uh, the discussion in discourse related to evidence informed policy making. However, within ministries of health, important major decisions sometimes made by one small ad hoc study. And I'm not uh, sort of trivializing the, the fact, sometimes this is an important uh, and reliable source of evidence. So just think of, for example, 
in pharmacovigilance. So the, the pharmacovigilance approaches may result in one medicine being uh, removed from the market. So that's a major policy decision, but the source of evidence is coming from uh, type of data collection that could rely on certain cases of reports from the country. And then there are other types of studies, CAP studies or MNE studies, they result in major changes, shifts in policymaking in countries. So then it's important to be considered in the package. Usually such uh, approaches are uh, focused on existing policies and are used for guiding implementation or changing the course of action when needed. So going back to the concept I talked about, in a way then uh, sort of, they, they, they all play within an ecosystem. I mean, I'm using the terminology that is used by the EBITNET uh, for the concept. So in a way, it's, it's not happening within the, only the concept of what's going on in terms of uh, focus on policy making process. It's about the uh, capacity of the economic, uh, the academic system, it's the whole of government and the relationship with evidence and decision making. And all those elements of different uh, players that are in the game and different uh, uh, sort of, uh, for example, multinational uh, institutions that are involved in the process, they all have a role to, to uh, in support or maybe sometimes as a hindrance for evidence uh, informed policy making at national level. So when all of those I mean, consider, I mean, uh, trying to take the theory into action, then there are certain questions to be answered that are applicable everywhere. I mean, and sometimes the answers to these questions are not I mean, the black and white, and they might vary or change and uh, sort of mature over time. So as I mentioned, I mean, integration is the key, is the key. They should be linked to each other. I mean, we see many programs, for example, that the country has a guideline program, but not talking to this HTA program. I do refer to that. And these, those should be brought together. But then the major question, especially for many low and middle income countries, but more and more also applicable to high income context, is that how much to adapt from existing knowledge uh, from other countries. And then if you say, oh, I want to adapt, so then what's the process for that? What is the priority setting criteria for that? How do you decide where to adapt, where to develop? The role of academic institutions. So that's a key issue. I mean, to use them as partners, to use them as former collaborators, or I mean, to use their products. I mean, you see a picture that in many countries that the, the link is not direct. So that means the full capacity is not being used. Other the stakeholders, I mean, which one of them, when to use them, how to use them, how to engage them. And then talk, to what extent the process of evidence informed policy making should be standardized. By that, I mean sort of thinking of the number of decisions a policymaker is, is making or needs to make on a sort of I mean, a given period of time. If you say every decision should follow every step that we are discussing, then probably make it an impossible or very costly process that may not pay dividend and would not be sustainable. So then, the decisions, explicit decisions are needed, and uh, thoughtful decision where to engage the standardized processes, where you can be relaxed further, and what type of um, sort of decision requires what approach. So this is about, I mean, there are, I mean, there are cases that in, in our region, for example, countries that do not have HDA program, they do not have a guideline program, they do not have an established knowledge generation program. So if those do not exist, obviously the main uh, task is to establish capacity. But there are countries that they have HTA programs. They have all of these elements there, but the programs are not talking to each other. There is a guideline program that doesn't talk to the HTA program, and they may end up with uh, different recommendations. So bringing them together, together is key. So in this slide, very quickly, I mean, so if an HTA system should, uh, should be able to function, if it exists, then there are certain elements to be seen. I mean, it should be linked with other programs, should be based, based on priority setting approaches, conflict of interest should be managed, and then the standards of conduct, I mean, in terms of what methodologies to use. I mean, so, uh, uh, my apologies, if not all of you are familiar with economic evaluation terminologies, I mean, what would be the discount rate, what is the modeling standards, et cetera, et cetera. But then if you look at the, all these questions I'm raising here, or these elements, and then you, as a national, at national level in the decision making, if you answer those questions, in a way you are also answering this question for other elements of evidence from policy making. 
So that doesn't actually make it quite possible and feasible to bring programs together and talk to each other. Now I'm going to the uh, I mean, final part of my talk. So in terms of what's happening in the region in terms of WHO support. So there is a regional action plan based on the resolution I referred to in 2019. It highlights six strategies, three for countries of the region. So this has been approved by the ministers of health of the region and three for the WHO. So the WHO is in enhancing capacity of WHO for response, but also uh, making better linkages for the countries, et cetera. For countries, I mean, it's about demand resources and, and processes. And within those, are, there are very, I mean, the, the, I mean the clear recommendation at three levels, what is essential, what is desirable, and what is optimal so that the countries can select and decide which to use. And there are examples of them given here. I'm not going through the details, but I mean, the key sort of objectives under the strategies are listed here under each objectives. Also, there are actions that countries can adopt. And this has gone to, I mean, extensive consultation with experts as well as with countries before being finalized. As part of the work, also a network was established. This is affiliated to the family of the global EVIP network. So, in, in, so it's in the region, it's a network of institutions, not individuals. Now it's active in 21 countries out of 22 countries of the region. There are 33 member institutions and 12 supporting institutions. There are programs going on on that. I refer to one of the works of the network supported by the WHO later on, but I mean, this has, this has been the platform for action. But then there has been sort of capacity building region-wide that has been conducted in the last I mean, year or so. Many of them have been focused on training programs. Within training programs, there has been sort of uh, conducting regional level activities. I refer to some of those tailored uh, programs for countries specifically, but most importantly, developing a resource that is actually available to all. And, I, and that was, I mean, an innovation that uh, WHO took in the region and brings a lot of I mean, good resources together. So this is referring to that last one. I mean, there was an assessment of different packages. So under 13 subject areas, training packages were identified globally to search up, uh, I mean, resources online, also main bodies that they provide capacity for such situation. Any program that was free of charge, accessible online, and had a sort of, I mean, based on a rapid assessment, had a good uh, relevance to, uh, in terms of quality and reliability, was brought together. And now that, that's available on their website, uh, web page. The link is, uh, on the slide, I'm not going to click on it. I mean, it in worry of that, I mean, if, uh, the link doesn't work. But if you click, you get to such a page like this. So there is a guiding flowchart. So you ask you certain questions. Are you a policymaker? Are you a support person? I mean, in terms of evidence provider. So if you need to policy briefs, click here, and then you get to the list of several uh, training uh, uh, sort of opportunities about conflicts of interest management. Then you click here, it's about communicating evidence with this here. And under each, there are different packages. And some of these are done by the WHO, but most of them, they are not. So it's actually a wealth of resources globally under one web page that is available. In terms of programs, I mean, three programs have been listed. For example, a consolidated program for policy brief development, which is a key element. So general principles, and then the two specific ones, one advanced one for the policy developers and researchers, one, one for policymakers on the use. And then these, I mean, as they are conducted by WHO, they become available also on that web page, given that, I mean, these ad hoc trainings, they cannot respond to the needs of the countries. On one key action of the network, there were 15 cases studies conducted in use of evidence and data in response to COVID pandemic. So I've listed them in the sort of the, uh, those cases studies, the, the countries, I mean, 13 countries of the region conducting <clears throat> 15 uh, cases studies. And as you can see, I mean, as I referred earlier, for many of these, I mean, these cases studies, the main source of evidence used for policy making was actually surveys or routine data, which shows, I mean, if, uh, they are not addressed directly in terms of how they should be used and how they should inform policy making, we actually miss a major part of decision-making processes that relies on different sources of evidence. 
And lastly, and this is my uh, one to the last slide, is that I mean, in terms of national level, and this is our major program, we work with countries at the national level for the whole processes. There are three countries as a sort of pioneering countries in the region, one high income country, that's Kuwait, one middle income country is Morocco, and one low income country, Somalia. And the reason the countries were identified among different income groups was that uh, to, to ensure the lessons learned could be applicable to all countries of the region and also globally. And hopefully in 2013 to, to 2023, we will expand to other resources. And these are some references. Um, many thanks for the opportunity and thanks Gordon for sharing this session. Arash, thank you for an extremely informative presentation. Um, great broad overview of the WHO uh, work in the area, and also for staying to time, which is a real accomplishment for many people. So thanks very much. That's great. Um, John has asked me to be very brief in my introduction, but I will say that he's the lead writer for the Global Commission on Evidence to Address Societal Challenges. Uh, which is the direct topic, and he's co-lead of the COVID End Evidence Network to support decision making in Canada. Um, he is also a uh, member of the department at McMaster, of which I am a member, and um, a in terms of uh, my pride in that department and what it does, a world leader in evidence based health policy. Over to you, John. Thanks very much, Gordon. I'm assuming you can see my slides. Um, yes, we can yes. see your slides. Great, excellent. So Gordon mentioned COVID end, uh, which we got going uh, back in April of 2020. We brought together 55 of the world's leading evidence groups and about a year into that effort, felt like we were at a critical juncture, uh, perhaps a better opportunity than we'd had in the previous uh, 25 years to dramatically up our game and how we used evidence. So we brought together the Evidence Commission. In January of this year, we released the report in a few few languages. It's now available in seven, including uh, languages widely spoken in the Eastern Mediterranean, like Arabic, French, and so on. Um, I'm going to speak primarily to one of our three current implementation priorities, formalizing and strengthening domestic evidence support systems. It lines up very, very well with what Arash has talked about. Um, I'll just be using slightly different language, but the notion of using many forms of evidence, um, as Arash has been calling for, is central to what we're we're talking about here. I just have a few slides where I'll connect this to the idea of rapid learning health systems because many of you are, are focused on the health space. Our commissioners cover all types of societal challenges. So it's important to note this is not health specific, but also very relevant to health. All types of decision makers, government policymakers, organizational leaders, professional citizens, and they cover all forms of evidence and they're drawn from all regions. Some of you may know asthma from uh, Abu Dhabi as uh, one example in the fourth column. Um, I mentioned before that one of our three implementation priorities is formalizing and strengthening domestic evidence support systems. We're currently working with 12 countries, we'll soon be at 12, to assess what is going well uh, with their evidence support systems and where are the opportunities to do better. We're doing a deeper dive in some jurisdictions like Canada, where we're looking separately at our federal government all 13 of our provinces and territories separately, and then doing a deeper dive on the pan-Canadian health evidence support system. Given our focus is broader than health, and that so much uh, of the rules of the game about how evidence gets used are set by central agencies, we're looking at those. So these include things like cabinet office or privy council office, Treasury Board Secretariat, Ministry of Finance. We're also looking at a, the Science and Technology Department, if it exists. We're looking at a number of line departments. That's where ministries of health would play in. And we're also looking at parliamentary bodies. And we're asking, what do they have in place to quickly mobilize evidence to deal with emergent issues? 
And what partnerships do they have that allow them to uh, complement their in-house capacity? I won't go into the methods in detail, um, but I'll just give you a feel for the types of people that we speak to. So in the federal government in Canada, these are examples of the types of uh, folks we speak to. Typically, it's the deputy minister who is our top public servant in these areas. Sometimes it may be an assistant deputy minister or a CEO of an independent agency. Mostly what I want to spend my time doing is telling you what we say in a typical call with top government officials to give you a feel for how you may want to speak to government officials if you're trying to get them to up their game and how they use evidence. And then again, I'll have a few slides where I tell you how we talk to people that are involved in health systems. So goals of the discussion, a bit of context, a framing of the problem, a pragmatic approach to moving forward. And then I won't go into them here, but for any given government official, we have questions very specific to their role uh, based on what we've determined from the outside uh, where the opportunities may lie to do better. So we say to them, we want to give you some context. We want to share with you what we learned from looking at your part of government from the outside. We want to talk about the things that are going well, but we also want to talk about where we see some of the key gaps. We, in the process, may bring to your attention assets in the system for evidence that you may not be aware of and can start using right away. And we want to know who's the champion in your part of government who we could work with um, to dramatically improve evidence use. So I'll give you a feel for how we talk about the context. So we talk about two lessons learned from COVID. One, the heartbreakingly low signal to noise ratio in the evidence coming out. So these are bar charts of all the evidence syntheses for COVID-19, uneven coverage of topics, typically low quality, one in four in light blue of the syntheses for COVID-19 were low quality, uh, one half of them were only medium quality, many rapidly outdated. The world would have been much better off with an evolving suite of high quality living evidence syntheses. Second lesson learned, we can't continue to respond to policymakers' questions with preprints that haven't been independently assessed for quality and slotted in, in alongside other studies based on their quality in a living evidence synthesis. We can't listen, keep listening to squeaky wheel experts who aren't transparent about the evidence underpinning their claims. And we can't keep relying on old school expert panels, which we call gobsat, good old boys sitting around the table. On the right side, we make the point that we also can't rely on select forms of evidence. Data analytics, modeling, one-off evaluation studies very helpful, but we need the right mix of forms of evidence for the right questions. We sometimes also put up this as one of our podium finish slides to say, in some instances, we're not even on the podium. So this is pointing to Canada, where at our federal level, we had 17 expert panels, typically following a gobsat approach. Uh, we only had one national expert panel that tried to follow higher standards. And then we looked with envy at Australia's living COVID-19 guidelines uh, being updated as often as once a week, starting as far back as April of 2020. Some of the other pieces of the context that are important for doing better are the innovations that emerged as part of COVID-19, its evidence response. In the past, policymakers always said, you can never work with the same speed as our policy processes, but we proved that to be incorrect during COVID-19. We were able to provide ultra rapid evidence support, uh, pulling together best evidence in as little as one to 10 days, but we could do that because there were high quality living evidence syntheses, like the one maintained by Gordon and his colleagues on all drug treatments. We may present an evidence scan. We may be looking across uh, subnational jurisdictions or across countries saying, what are the emergent approaches? We may be looking out into the future with horizon scans. We may be doing key informant interviews to get practical vaccine rollout experiences from people at the leading edge of work in that space. We also showed during COVID-19 that we could better coordinate the supply of different forms of evidence. So a question could come in 
And in Canada, to give you an example, we could turn to any of 40 teams across the country prepared to provide timely demand-driven evidence response. We could also leverage one-stop shops, and we could leverage the types of living evidence syntheses that Gordon and many others were involved in uh, maintaining. The third part of the context is this growing recognition that we need an evidence support system working alongside the research system, research system focused on peer-reviewed grants, peer-reviewed publications, an innovation system focused on patents and licenses and commercialization. We need a way to provide timely, demand-driven, contextualized evidence support to decision-making and do that in an equity-sensitive way. And that means we need infrastructure like evidence support units, like expert panels that use best methods, like government science advisors who speak in a way that make it possible to judge their accuracy, and a number of processes to mainstream the use of evidence in decision-making processes. And part of what that evidence support system needs to do is match the form of evidence to the right step in the decision-making process. Countries like Canada are very obsessed with data analytics. It's helpful at the front end with a problem workup, helpful at the back end with monitoring, not helpful with selecting options or thinking about implementation plans. So we need the right tools to answer the right question. We also need to combine the best local evidence. So what have we learned in Canada or Saudi Arabia with the best global evidence? What have we learned from around the world, including how it varies by groups and contexts? Um, many of the people we speak to in government don't know what an evidence synthesis, let alone a living evidence synthesis. So there are assets out there that would help them to make more informed decisions, but they're not even on their radar. So they're looking locally for some forms of evidence, not thinking about the right combination of the local knowledge um, and the best global knowledge. So how we now talk about the big problem is that it falls into three areas. There's challenges on the evidence demand side. So those asking us for evidence. There's challenge on the supply side with what we give them. And there's challenges in how those two things work together. In the early days on the demand side, we were suggesting you should be putting in place a checklist like this or a mechanism like this. And the response from a number of people is, our biggest problems are actually capacity and culture. And the, the capacity issue is that many governments around the world have had a hollowing out of their policy capacity. They don't have staff who can slice and dice problems, options, implementation considerations. And if you can't do that, it's really difficult to pull in the right evidence for whatever the question is. So we need to work on capacity. We also were struck by people's comments of the culture. They said, as long as we live in a system of no transparency, in the evidence inputs that go into decision making, we will never change because people will simply say, don't worry, we do it. We need to start to become transparent on those evidence inputs. People said this in the past about transparency around travel and expense claims. Those are now shared in many countries. The sky didn't fall. They said the same thing around briefings to deputy ministers in onboarding sessions. Sky didn't fall. We need to start to see transparency in the evidence inputs going into decision making. Um, there's a widespread lack of awareness of fundamental concepts that are probably well known to all of you, but they're not widely known in government. There's sometimes a tendency to assert we do this already, even though we can assess some of the inputs to their decision making and show that they're of very low quality. And if we continue down this path, we'll have lots of low quality processes, suboptimal results, and very high opportunity costs. So we have real challenges on the demand side but we also don't have good mechanisms to get the right evidence to people when they make the request. And those helping them with evidence who are often management consulting firms, not people who understand uh, all of the strengths and limitations of an evidence base, they are also potentially part of the problem. 
So now on to my final slides related to the evidence support system. This is how we now talk about how we strengthen a country's evidence support system. So line departments like health alone or in combination with central agencies need to build capacity, address the culture, and leverage enablers for evidence use. I won't go into the detail. I've foreshadowed some of the capacity issues, some of the culture issues, but we need to make this a normal way of doing business in government. Next thing we need to do is we need to get better request and response systems. They're currently very, very fragmented, but we've shown during COVID-19 that well-organized governments can coordinate their requests People on the supply side can better coordinate their responses and integrate responses across forms of evidence so the requesters don't have to do it for them. And the final thing that we need to do on the evidence support side is make sure we can cover all key forms of evidence. In countries like Canada, we underuse behavioral and implementation research. We underuse living syntheses and guidelines. We need standards for key forms of evidence. The, the, the evidence syntheses often sent into our governments in our country and many others are consistently of very low quality, then that is not acceptable. And we need to develop and implement standards for key types of evidence products and processes. So that's how we talk to government officials. We're trying to be provocative. We're trying to say, here's what we think the problem is based on looking at what you do and talking to key leaders. This is what we think would help to make things better. Do you agree with our diagnosis? Do you agree with our proposal for how to improve things? And that's how we think we'll get most quickly to making things better. I mentioned I would just quickly make some connections to health systems. So many countries around the world starting to use the language of a learning health system. Um, learning and improvement can happen at many levels in a health system, and you'll see that in the pyramid. We find that health systems often need what we call general contractors, people who can pull together different forms of evidence. Folks like me are more helpful higher up that pyramid because we have policy systems, political analysis expertise. And we find that when you're dealing with healthcare teams and clinicians, it's the folks that have the behavioral implementation research expertise who are the better contractors, the better pull, the folks better positioned to pull together different forms of evidence. Learning health systems need to really be good at making sense of challenges and goals and then prioritizing. They need to be good at co-designing new approaches to care delivery, and they need to be good at, at implementing and adapting. But that means they need a high functioning evidence support system that they draw on in each of those steps. They need different types of evidence at each of those steps. So everything that I've talked about with the evidence support system, I was talking more in relation to government policymakers, but it also relates to those of us trying to strengthen health systems and get the right program services and products to people. In the old days, research and care delivery were very separate. We've had a decade or more of KTE hasn't solved our problems, where a lot of people are now focused on developing these embedded evidence support units, working with applied researchers at the interface between those two, relying on the general contractors to bring together the different forms of evidence, and then pulling in the right trade, the evaluator, the behavioral scientist, the qualitative researcher, as need be. I won't go into it, but the Evidence Commission has other um, implementation priorities, strengthening the global evidence architecture. We have to get to a well-funded, evolving suite of living evidence syntheses globally. We cannot replicate the chaos that we saw during COVID-19. We also need to put evidence at the center of everyday life for citizens. It should not be as hard as it is for everyday citizens to be able to access and use evidence in their everyday lives. Um, and now feels like the right time. So I don't have time to go into it, but 
In my 25 years of working in this space, I have never felt there was a better time for a dramatic improvement in how we use evidence. So my final slide is, if you haven't seen it already, take a look at the Evidence Commission report, at least the executive summary. It's probably available in one or more of the languages that you speak. Uh, keep up on new developments by following us on Twitter. If you're not one of the countries for which we're already uh, working in partnership with others to do a rapid assessment of your country's evidence support system and you think you may have the skills to work on this let us know and then try and uh, identify and join forces with other champions in your region and you've just heard uh, one of the most prominent globally a rash a real leader in this space so we need to be working with well-positioned uh, leaders like a rash so that's a quick run through gordon i'll turn it back to uh to turn it back to you okay fantastic summary of remarkable work um, we have both a chat and a question and answer, and I would, there's 190 people who have joined us on this call, so lots of people to ask questions, and we've got almost 20 minutes to do that. Uh, Melanie Golub has asked the first question, and she comments, government notoriously changes very slowly and is underfunded. Are there any ways to help support the use of an evidence support system given these barriers? My perception is that you've both offered a number of answers to that question, but um, people often like highlights of just perhaps what is most crucial to help support the use of uh, to help support the use of an evidence support system given the barriers. Arash, what would you say are the key ways to help support? Yeah, many thanks, uh, and uh, I think that's a good question. I would, I, I don't disagree with the concept behind the question. So I mean, sort of being a slow to change, but I also say sometimes also governments are rapidly changing, resulting, for example, you establish a system for evidence informed policy making, a change in the government, the, the process is lost or not being followed. And we saw examples of that, especially in terms of COVID 19. In countries, we did not expect to see that. I mean, it was assumed the system is so entrenched, it wouldn't happen, but maybe the level of the emergency sort of. So, so in a way, I would see it has both elements. So it's, it's slow, but it could be also not in the fast, not in the right direction at the same time. The main thing I would say, especially about underfunding, is that so often what, what is the key important factor for evidence informed policymaking is. Uh, demand for it and being able to live with it. I mean, if it brings advice that, uh, uh, for example, is not in line with your pre assumed recommendation. And within that, the, the thing that always works better is the capacity within the civil servants within the government. So, those people who run the show behind the scene and they prepare the policy advice, usually those are the people who become the remaining parts. And if they are funded through the processes that are routine financial processes that make it possible. So although I, I first refer to the issue of that the processes might collapse or may not be followed properly, but the best thing is to make sure there are processes inside the country. That applies to where that the ministries of health have a strong function and a structure and well financed. I know that's not the case everywhere. In a few countries of our region, Ministries of Health they actually have problem in funding and financing their own staff. So within those processes, then making sure there is a sort of linkages of the program, bringing sort of all the players together and putting the sort of these processes as part of the fundraising and support for the country becomes key. Okay, thanks very much. I still only have, you can still use the chat or the question and answer. I've still only got Melanie's up. So please, if anyone has any questions uh, or comments that you want a response to, please offer them. John, what if you were picking one or two or three key ways to help support the use of an evidence support system, what would you suggest? Well, maybe I'll I'll tackle it, it, it with a uh, focus on two things that Melanie said. One is that government um, notoriously changes slowly. And to Arash's point, I think governments can change quickly when the right conditions are in place. And, and typically, 
what you need are a compelling problem, a viable policy and conducive politics. And you, uh, you need a policy entrepreneur who sees those opportunities and can pursue them and who also is really adept at seeing the windows of opportunity where that change can happen. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in the 12 countries we're currently working in is we're saying we have an incredibly compelling description of the problem with COVID-19, but with an array of societal challenges, we think we found a viable policy. And we can articulate for any given jurisdiction why the politics may be right at this moment in time. And we're trying to find these champions or policy entrepreneurs who can push it. So I would encourage all of you to think seriously about um, if you're committed to using evidence, then think about how are you going to marshal these arguments um, and find the right policy entrepreneur? You will not get a better window of opportunity, I don't believe, than we have now. Um, it's been the best we have seen in my 25 year long uh, career since I finished my PhD. Then the issue around governments being underfunded, one of the heartbreaking things with COVID-19 was the extraordinary amount of research waste. Um, Again, we would have been better off with a small number of living evidence syntheses and the number of, of dollars and uh, other currencies wasted on low quality syntheses of single drug molecules where instead people should have just been looking to a regularly updated living evidence synthesis of all drug treatments, three groups in the world doing them to extraordinarily high standards, one of whom was Gordon, Romina and colleagues at McMaster. And if we just reallocate from these incredibly low value processes, and put it into investments in higher value processes, we would do much better. So even if our budgets stay the same, um, a lot of these changes can be um, uh, can be supported simply by reallocating our resources to higher value products and processes. Okay, thanks very much, John. I'm still waiting for other questions in either the question and answer or the chat. While we're waiting, arrest. Could you tell us a success story from the WHO in terms of evidence-based policy making? Give us, give us something to uh, offer a model of what can happen if things go right. Can you think of something? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, are you talking, I mean, I can actually take it, trying to take it from a different angle. One is within WHO decision processes. Uh, one would be that in support of countries in terms of decision making. So within WHO processes, I mean, the, what happened as a result of COVID, I mean, has been, I mean, there has been phenomenal examples of how the science processes, I mean, but let's say, I mean, developing a guideline that requires, but that gives recommendations is a slow process everywhere. And it's definitely a slow within WHO guidelines program. But I mean, I, I'm a member of the WHO Guideline Review Committee and I'm the vice chair of the committee. And the speed by which the, the, the committee work in making sure the recommendations based on the latest evidence come quickly in response to the needs that happened during COVID was quite phenomenal. I mean, the science team's behavior became totally different as John also was referring to different elements of that. In our region as well, I mean, what happened was that, again, I mean, so my department is the science information dissemination department. So it's a, a technical department, not part of the emergency department, but that this department was fully engaged in emergency response, making sure the latest evidence is available for the uh, WHO decision at the time of need. So I think that these, these were good examples of how within WHO processes could also improve further. And there are a lot of lessons learned for us to engage more with the sort of emergency program and the, the rapid response that is required in a context that is not the usual context for evidence-informed uh, policymaking. In terms of national level, so I mean, what would I suggest? Yeah, I mean, there are very good examples, but I mean, they go for a specific area. So I mean, one good example I would say happened in terms of uh, Somalia, and this has been fully highlighted. In a way, it's more of a use of the result of 
evidence rather than sort of generating evidence for decision is more about a sort of how to make sure if there is a good solution, you plan for it for implementation. So one thing that I'm indicating very clear, so usually I mean that the need for oxygen as a, as a medical oxygen within the healthcare setting is well known, okay? But COVID showed that the need is much bigger than we had thought. Most systems around the world, especially the first year, they, they had major challenges to respond. So there were evidence-informed solutions for that. And then in one of the least uh, sort of, I mean, uh, resource countries of the region in Somalia, one of the best solution was implemented with support actually with, uh, with uh, um, uh, actually with Canada supporting the, the, the global challenge, Canada, I think if I state term correctly. So that became a program that brought sort of sources of evidence, the innovation response to that. So it's not a classic example, but I'm just trying to give it uh, on top of my head. The, yeah, I mean, sort of. Yeah. Those were great answers off the top of your head. Um, so Lubna John has been asking us um, in the question and answer, a plan for disseminating the findings of the report, uh, reactions, any success stories to share? So, uh, I mean, at, at a high level, the dissemination is happening through uh, language specific launches. So th these began back in January with English and French and have steadily proceeded to all the language through all the languages. The only one we haven't yet got to is Arabic. And the plan is to work with um, colleagues in the Eastern Mediterranean region to organize something in November. So that sometimes helps a bit with awareness raising, but uh, we uh, determined early on that reports on their own don't make a, a big impact unless you can land the story in a very specific context, um, celebrating what's already going well, but also identify the opportunities to improve and, and sometimes goading people a little bit with comparisons. Why, why could Australia turn to living guidelines as far back as April of 2020 and, and Canada persisted with many gobset type processes? Um, so that's why we're so focused on these rapid jurisdictional assessments because we think the stories need to be built country by country, province and state by province and state to land it for that country, what is going well that you can build on. Arash mentioned this earlier, some countries have an HTA unit, some have a guideline process, some have other pieces. So how do you help them to systematize what's going well? up their game when there's opportunities for improvement and then prioritize which gaps to fill. So that's what we're currently focused on is country by country, understanding what's going well according to the insights from the evidence commission and where the real priorities for action are. And we're being, as I mentioned before, very provocative saying, here's our diagnosis. Here's what we think your context specific solutions are. What do you think? And we're trying to find those champions who can, can make change happen. So dissemination is one piece, but it's, it's building those conditions for political impact that we're most focused on. Uh, very nice. Um, so, uh, Zoram Hamdi has asked, don't you think it'd be very relevant to have publications about the learned lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, especially from the pioneer groups? Um, either uh, Aresh or John, you want to comment on that? Well, I think uh, we, we... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Aresh. Oh, yeah, okay. Very quickly. I mean, so I refer to 15 case studies related to use of evidence for COVID in 13 countries of the region. There is a sort of a meeting, I mean, so all, all the cases that is, I mean, they have been documented, they will be presented to the inter-country meeting later in October, just in, in about 10 days. And then they will be published as well. So there's a plan of publication for that. There are also the sort of the experience of, I mean, larger experiences are being documented as well. So, I mean, that's, that's the plan that we have for the and then what I was going to say is what we tried to do in the Evidence Commission report was this, albeit at a high level of generalization across countries, but because we had uh, 25 commissioners from around the globe, we could 
um, you know, test our assumptions about whether these were widespread experiences and in what went well and what could have gone better on the evidence demand side and also on the uh, evidence supply side. And I highlighted some of the innovations. You know, we've been blown away by, you know, living evidence syntheses about all COVID drug treatments, all done to an extraordinarily high standard, all updated regularly. I mean, the work that Gordon and others have done is extraordinary. So how do we, we can't necessarily sustain that energy you know, over long periods of time, we really need to prioritize what are those essential pieces that we need to get done. But then the other pieces, again, back to my story of the arguments for doing better have to be made specific to the country. So I would encourage all of you to be telling the stories from your country about what went well with the evidence response to COVID-19 and what didn't go well that point us to doing things better in the future, both for the slow burn issues that we were all returning to, but also so we're better positioned to uh, address future crises. So uh, we really need to understand those. And on the weekend, I facilitated a dialogue with senior leaders from two federal government departments in Canada. and. And it was so great to hear them give an illustration about how one particular thing they did in how they coordinated flows of evidence related to COVID-19 and how that fed directly day in, day out into decision-making. And looking back, they were proud of it. And they began to ask the question, why don't we have this in, that operates across all of the questions that we're dealing with? We should be, we could do it during COVID-19. So let's build on that and figure out how we do it um, across all the health questions we have. Th these were two health focus groups. So again, by all means, celebrate what went well, document it, identify the gaps, document it, and talk about how we build a better future based on those and other lessons. What a great summary of where we should go, John, to end off. That was really excellent. And it so happens to come at the 59th minute. Um, so uh, your timing was perfect there, John. Um, so thanks. We've had great attendance. Um, I note that there at the moment are our peak of 200 people who have attended this. Um, so I'd also like to say not only uh, uh, we've obviously, Arash and John, uh, you've attracted a great audience. Um, I'd also like to say thanks to Lubna and her team for facilitating this brilliantly. It's really, uh, it's really been an impressive success. And this session, uh, really a highlight of that impressive success. So thank you, John and Arash, and thanks to all those who attended. Take care. Bye Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.